the name of Jesus, Lord, and uh, again, we thank you so much for your word that you've given us just to, Lord, speak to our hearts by your spirit, and Lord, just change us as we need to be changed, conforming us into the image of Christ. We thank you for that, Lord, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, just one last note about Wednesday. Um, I love the way the Lord worked this out. Is Wednesday, we're going to be in Isaiah 8 and 9. And you, if you know what's in Isaiah 9, it's, For unto us a child is born. Unto us his son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. So we're going to deal with that passage on Wednesday night. And it's, a, again, it's exciting to see when the Lord works things out. Uh, let's turn in our Bibles now to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 6 through 16. And as you're turning there, this is the fourth week we, of our study in 1 Corinthians. If you've missed any of it, you can get it online. And the reason I say that is because we've seen this development of what Paul is sharing with the Corinthians here. He started out by saying, by demonstrating how life is all about Jesus. And then secondly, he went on to discuss the divisions that, they were, um, that there were among them because they were getting into camps thinking, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm saying I'm of Jesus. You know, they were dividing in this way. And then last week we looked at how he stressed to them we, the need to see life from the perspective of the cross. Now, this morning, we're beginning, we're not going to get all the way through this section because, because it continues on into chapter 3, and we discuss three types of people. We begin by, well, we talk about here the spiritual man, those who have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, the natural man man apart from God who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And those we'll look at today. And next week, we'll look at the carnal man. Then stay tuned next week to find out about him. Um, but as we study this passage this morning, what we're looking at, what we'll be looking at, and it's so important, you know, when we look at all of the things that are going on in the world today, all the confusion, all of those things, and you think, where's wisdom in all of this? Where's the wisdom? And so what we're looking at today is um, how we can gain spiritual wisdom. Now, in verses 6 through 8, we again see that there is a great need for spiritual wisdom. As it says here in verses 6 through 8, however, well, let me back up a second and go to the verse before that just to give us context again. Um, back to verse 4, it said, uh, it says, and my speech He's talking as he came into uh, Corinth. And my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Verse 6. However... We speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for if they had, for had they known, excuse me, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So, as he begins here in verse 6, he says, we don't speak to you in the wisdom of this age. As it says there, the, um, 
However, we do not speak the wisdom of this age. Paul has just said that when he came, he didn't speak to them in human wisdom, but he only wanted to know to them Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what he wanted to get across to them. That's the central focus, Jesus and what he has accomplished for us on our behalf. Not all this stuff about ourselves that they were getting into. He now says that he speaks wisdom, though, to the mature. Now, when we're talking about, you know, to the mature, he's talking to those who are obviously able to receive it. In fact, in Hebrews 5.14, it says, but solid food is, uh, belongs to those who are of full age or mature. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And the question for us is, are we able to study the word of God for ourselves and take it and apply it to our lives? Because that's really what he's getting at with them and talking about those who are mature. If you can handle it, we speak wisdom to the mature, those who can take the word of God and say, oh, that's what it says, and apply it to their lives and begin to walk in it. An age refers to a specific period of time, the culture, and the way people think within that period. As he says here, we don't teach, we don't proclaim the wisdom of this age. The rulers of this age are those in authority within an age and operate according to the wisdom of that age. You know, what just seems to make sense to the world, but doesn't seem to make sense to people that have spiritual wisdom. I mean, look at the situation we're in. And when you think the decisions that were made that make sense to the people that are making them. And then, I mean, look, you, when you cut off a pipeline, they, you're getting oil into your country, you're profiting, you know, keeping the gas prices down. And so they go up, and then you're having inflation because of it, and you start to blame the inflation on the pandemic, and you have all of this stuff going on. And it's like, where's the wisdom? I mean, it, it seemed like simple wisdom. You could see the interconnectedness of these things, but it seems like it's being missed. The wisdom of this age, though, the wisdom, you know, when he talks about this age, he's talking about this, this time in which we're living in the world. You know, yes, Christ has come. He's paid for our sins on the cross. He's risen again. He's coming again. But in that time in which we wait, we have these people around, you know, the unsaved people who don't understand. And they're just seeking to make decisions the best they know how. And you know people like that. They're just trying to make decisions the best way they know how. But where are their influences? You know, sometimes you can, you can tell you know, why people are thinking the way they are by the particular news broadcast they watch because they're getting all that information from that particular slant. So, you know, so they're making decisions in that way. So um, there's that fluidity. As believers, we're called to live from an eternal perspective. We should have God's perspective, as we'll see as we get to the end of this. You know, not merely to change what we think according to what's presently acceptable in the world. That's a dangerous position to be in when we do that. When we think, well, the world's thinking this way, so we have to go in that direction. No, we're called to be, you know, just the name church. It's the word in Greek, ekklesia, those who are called out. We're called out of this world to live distinctly and separately from the world, but still in the world. 
as the expression you've heard, to be in the world and not of the world. Because we're called here to be a witness. Uh, be a witness. And that, by definition, that fluidity is what progressive Christianity as it's being labeled today is. It's that change, that fluidity, just molding themselves to the world. But as Paul says here, that kind of wisdom is coming to nothing. It's coming to nothing. It's being done away with. It's not going to last. It can't. It's not self-sustainable because it's self-destructive. The end of the wisdom of this age is emptiness. When you seek to live by the world's standards, you see, it results in emptiness because, you know, the goalpost is always changing. It's like, oh, to be accepted, to be, for, have everything wonderful in this world and in this life, you have to do this. But next week it changes again, and you have to start all over. But as Paul says in verse 7, we speak wisdom that was revealed by God. Every age, every time period, historical time period, has what I call a conceit of its own. Thinking that they're more enlightened than those in the past. And we see this, you know, in the past couple of years with people wanting to tear down statues. Oh, we know better than them before. We can't have those things around. It offends us. But God's wisdom does not change, but is eternal and absolute. When you know God in his word, you know the right that is always right. And he says here that God's wisdom is hidden in eternity and his applications are foreordained, not an afterthought. And can only by be known, the wisdom of God can only be known by knowing God, by having a relationship with him. And as he says here that if the rulers of this age had any idea of God's wisdom, they would act completely differently. The outcome of God's word, excuse me, the outcome of God's wisdom is our glory. It's the glory of knowing God and experiencing a relationship with him. Uh, turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, picking up with verse 14. We kind of talk about this mystery as, as Paul, you know, he goes more in depth into it here in Ephesians chapter 3. Beginning with verse 14, he says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, to know the love of God which passes all knowledge, that you may be filled with or unto all the fullness of God. That he'll fill you with his presence. Now to him he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in him. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. 
So, this is what he desires to work out in our lives, is his glory manifested in our lives. But as we see in verse 8, getting back to it, again, we're looking at the natural man here. It says the rulers of this age, you know, they have no experience with God. They just don't get it. The words that they say about God is their, in their political speeches are empty. You'll hear a politician get up and try to, try to pander to believers and it's, they talk and you'll hear, you don't have a clue, do you? Because they really don't. But we don't depend on these leaders having a relationship with God, but we make sure that they know we do and that we're holding them accountable. If the rulers of the age had truly experienced a relationship with God, they would not have crucified the one who brings us into a relationship with God. They would not have crucified the Lord of glory, as it says. Because of your relationship with Jesus, the world, the rulers of this world, will treat you exactly the way they treated him. As it says in John 15, 20 through 21, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they would keep yours also. But all things they do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. Now, in verses 9 through 13, we see how we can receive spiritual wisdom. As it says here, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so... No one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may know, we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So God reveals what he has for us by his Spirit. Paul gives this solid scriptural basis for what he said by quoting uh, these verses from several verses from Isaiah. Isaiah 64, 4, 65, 17, and 52, 15 were kind of combined there into that quote that Paul used. The point is that you just can't figure out on your own what God has for you by a natural means. You just can't study a book, say, okay, the 10 ways to know what God has for you. Isn't going to happen. Just simply isn't going to happen. It's revealed to us by the Spirit of God because of the finished work of Christ. That he went to the cross, died for our sins, rose again, seated at the right hand of the Father, and Jesus said a couple of things before he left. One, if he, you know, as a, if I go, I prepare a place for you, and I'll come again to receive you to myself. He also said in John 14 and 16, he said, if I go, when I go, it's to your benefit, because when I go, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit that he may abide with you always. When Jesus was here, 
he was limited by space and time when he was here. Holy Spirit coming in us, coming upon us, not limited in that way. And he can be everywhere at the same time. He can indwell the hearts of every believer at the same time. And we can't know the things of God apart from the Spirit of God revealing them to us. Now, this is, and he's getting to basic Christianity 101 with the Corinthians here. You know, he had hoped that they, you know, he had been with them for a year and a half. He had been instructing them. He left. They got into the flesh. Now he's saying, okay, you need a remedial course here. And so he's telling them that, you know, it's not about dividing up into camps. It's not, you know, they were Greeks. And, you know, they, and so they wanted to be all philosophical. But he's basically saying, you know, bring your heads down out of the clouds and get real with Jesus. And here's the deal. God's a superior trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Man's an inferior trinity, spirit, soul, and body. When Adam sinned, his spirit died, or in a sense became inactive, infunctional. It couldn't work. When we're born again, what takes place is our, that's what being born again is about. We now, our spirit is made alive in Christ. And so in that, we can now relate to God by our spirit relating through the Holy Spirit. Now, as I said, the Holy Spirit is our link to God. He takes the truths of God and applies them to our hearts that we can receive them. We relate to God by our spirit when we're born again. You can't relate to God solely by your intellect. And I see, you know, I watch some videos on YouTube. And it's always dangerous because you watch anything on YouTube and they start sending you all kinds of videos from different people and you get on there. And you get people on there that have done these videos that are probably professors somewhere or theological professors somewhere. And they'll start talking about things like how you can't believe, well, you, you, we need you to instruct you how to understand the Genesis account, right? You know, God didn't really curse a snake and, all, you know, crawl in his belly and all of this. It's, it's figurative language and all this. I think, please. You know, and you can see people struggling in their natural ability to understand the things of God and they just totally miss it. They totally miss it. So I come across those videos and I hit the one, the, you know, you click the little button on the side and it comes up, not interested. Click, you know, because you get tired of hearing those things. Because it's the same thing over and over again. You have man trying to understand God in his wisdom apart from the spirit of God, which is impossible. It's impossible. You have to be born again to understand the things of God. Because you can't relate to God through your own intellect. John 4, 24 says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Only way we can relate to the Lord, ultimately. God's wisdom can only be known by God's people because they have the spirit because they have the Spirit. And we'll see that as we continue on here as well. Verses 11 through 12, we see that we really 
know what God has for us by the Spirit. It says, now Paul gives us this illustration of what he's been saying about the Holy Spirit. Now, when you read that, you might have been to a funeral before and heard this passage, you know, you know, somebody will get up and they're going, well, I has not seen nor ear heard nor has it entered into the heart of man what God's prepared for those who love him. Sounds really great at a funeral. The problem is that's not the context. That's not what he's been saying because if you think, oh man, you could teach this great sermon, you know, for a funeral and it really blessed people. But the next ver verse 10 to totally blows it away when it says, but God has revealed them to us by his spirit. It's his spirit revealing to us the things of God. Now, in verse, verses 11 and 12, as I said, you know, we see that it's really through the spirit that we know what God has for us. And he gives this illustration, and he says, you know, when dealing with yourself, with people, you know, really a man or a woman, you know, they're inclusive here, is only really ultimate knows, knows better than anyone else what's going on inside of him. Your spouse doesn't even understand everything that's going on completely in you. And ladies... You notice that all the time. You're trying to express to your husband what's going on, what you're feeling. They don't have a clue. They don't have a clue because they're not thinking in the same way and not, you know, all of that. So they're obviously not going to know everything that's going on with you. And so he says here in the same, it's the same way with the Lord. Who ultimately knows what's going on with God. The Spirit of God. And you see, that's the cool thing as believers, and that's what he's relating to us, because now we relate to God through his Spirit. The Spirit is the one who can search how God, even the deep things of God. As it says in Romans 8, 27, now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So in prayer even, as believers, we have this interaction taking place where, God, you know, the Spirit on the one hand knows what the will of God is for us and at the same time knows our heart's desire and what we're praying about, he can take those things and bring them together, change our hearts and our minds where necessary, get us on the same page with the Lord and going in the same direction. And so that he can answer those prayers. It, it's an incredible transaction taking place there. If you were born again, then you have access to the wisdom of God. In fact, James in James 1.5 challenges us, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. If you lack wisdom, if you need wisdom on making decisions, and we all do. And really, as believers, it's not that, oh, I have this decision kind of worldly decisions that I have to make, and I ha then I have spiritual decisions. If you are a Christian, if you're living in the Spirit, if you're walking by the Spirit, every decision that you make should be a spiritual decision. There's no dichotomy. There's no split. Oh, you know, today, I'm the Christian. No, I'm the natural man. No, it doesn't work that way. Our relationship with Jesus should affect everything we do. And so, as we're making decisions, we pray for wisdom. And you see how God works those situations out. As we look to him and not just try to, and the danger, you know, what takes place with the natural man is it's that person that's trying to do everything on their own. I did it my way. 
Good luck with that. You'll need it because it's not going to happen. It's not going to work out. Now, in verse 13, we see that we compare spiritual things with spiritual. The spirit is the key to everything. Salvation, when I share, when I go to teach God's word, and when you receive God's word when it's taught, the spirit is involved in all of this. It's not, you know, one part or the other. It's all of it. It, it was funny. One time when I was um, living in, we were living in St. Augustine and we're looking to the Lord for, you know, what he wanted us to do, how he wanted us to move. I sat and listened to this message by up in Calvary Chapel, Orange Park, friend of mine, Chris Frederick, is the pastor, listened to the message there and I heard it and I thought, the Lord just told me, the worst does it, head out of here and head south. And we did. We made that decision. There was that witness of the Spirit. We did it, and God blessed. And, you know, we sold our house in St. Augustine. We moved at that time to West Palm Beach, and we lived there for a couple of years. As we went down the, you know, we later, I went and tried to listen to that same message again, and I didn't have a clue what I heard from before because I went and it was the spirit taking it what he wanted me to get and applying it to my heart I didn't need it later again so he does that he takes the messages he takes and you know I've shared before how often you know you guys will come you'll listen to a message here and God will take something and apply it in your life you'll go out and you'll drive, be driving on the way home you'll turn on the radio and somebody will come on and say the same thing and you know and you'll get up and do your devotionals and oh there's the same thing again oh Lord it's the Holy Spirit working enjoy it enjoy it this is fellowship with God. God instructing you personally. This is, that's the normal Christian life. You know, looking to him, seeking him, depending upon him in all things. And the things that are revealed to us, Paul is saying, by the Spirit, we turn around and, and we can instruct others by the Spirit. But like Paul, as he says twice in 1 Corinthians, once dealing in the communion passage in chapter 11 and another time in dealing with the gospel, he says, these things I receive from the Lord that which I also share with you, and that's what we're to do. So we're to receive from the Lord and then share what we receive from the Lord. Not our own advice. Always a mistake to share our own advice. You get in a lot of trouble that way. So the wisdom of God is spoken by the Holy Spirit to and through the people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Those who receive them judge for themselves the content of how it applies to them. What do I mean by that? Back there when we said in verse 13, as it says, these things we also speak not in the words which human wisdom teaches, but, by the, but which the Spirit, the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. How does that work? It's the Holy Spirit in us, the Holy Spirit ministering to us through his word, through somebody else. Those things come together. He applies it to our hearts and our lives, and we go, oh, light bulb goes on. We understand. We see what the Lord's instructing us in. But
but what is necessary for the spiritual man is that he be walking in the Spirit. As it says in Galatians 5, 24 through 25, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit, or that in could be translated by as well, because the same word in Greek is in, with, or by. So if we live by the Spirit, we should also walk by the Spirit. That's how we're called to live as believers. Now, in verses 14 through 16, we see who can receive spiritual wisdom. As it says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The natural man can't grasp the things of the Spirit. We have seen the spiritual man who listens and depends upon the Holy Spirit. Now Paul addresses the person he calls the natural man. And that's the natural man that we inherited from Adam. It is the consciousness, life on a conscious level in the same way that animals experience a conscious life. Now, this word translated natural, when it says the natural man here, is actually the word for soul. So it's like saying the soulish man, the man who lives according to the soul. As I mentioned before, man being an inferior trinity, body, soul, and spirit, I see the Christian life is to be influenced by the Spirit. Spirit influences our soul, and we live then according to the Word of God and by the Spirit of God. Natural man, soulish man, can't walk in the Spirit. So what is he influenced to if the you know, the battle that takes place in the mind or in the soul, if you're only functioning on two out of three cylinders, you're functioning on body and soul, what's going to be influencing the soul in which you function? Through which you function? Your body, your desires, the things you want to do, all of those types of things, that's the way the natural man lives. Just totally influenced from that perspective, from that side. Not having really spiritual influence. But you say, well, Chris, what about all those religions out there that are having all kinds of wild experiences? Or even in some quote-unquote Christian circles that have these, most of those, or for the most part, they are emotional or soulish experiences. Even when you go, you know, go to the meetings that have, are doing things like, you know, where people getting slain in the spirit and things like that, where, you know, people are falling out, falling over, that sort of thing. Nothing about that in scripture. But what you find is people responding to things emotionally rather than spiritually and getting all charged up and hyped up in those ways emotionally. And that doesn't minister to people spiritually. So 
So, so we've seen the spiritual man who listens to and depends upon the Lord. Now we're looking at the natural man who's soulish. And spiritual things seem totally foolish to him, the natural man. The person who's living, it just doesn't make sense to him. Like those college professors who have spent years and years studying all kinds of things and what people think of this passage and who thinks what and this. But it's so cool to see you have all of these quote unquote great intellects and then you'll have somebody with no education who's filled with the spirit, who's in the word of God and he's reading it. You can get much more from that guy than you can from the other guy. Because he's walking in the spirit. He's hearing from the Lord. It's not anti-intellectual. I'm not saying that at all. But it all has to be brought under the control of the Lord through the Spirit. We're not making decisions in the flesh. Not solely making decisions because, you know, I read something somewhere. And it's interesting to me and applies to me. I apply this to myself greatly because, you know, I study. I study to prepare. You know, I, you know, get into the Word. Yes, I read what some other folks think, but if I don't stop and listen and think and pray, Lord, what do you want to get across here? And listen and get directed, then it's, gonna, it's not going to minister. It's going to fall flat because it would be me giving you kind of soulish gobbledygook. That sound might sound really intellectual, but doesn't minister to you. A ministry has to be of the Holy Spirit. Jude chapter 1, because there's only one, verses 17 through 19 says, But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there will be mockers in the last time who will walk according to their own ungodly lust. These are sensual persons who cause divisions not having the spirit. Not having the spirit. Also, it says, you know, on the one hand, the natural man doesn't understand the things of the spirit Then he says, nor can he know them. He lacks the capacity, the ability, because they're spiritually discerned. It's like saying that a blind person can't appreciate the sunset. Because he lacks the capability. He lacks the ability to do that. In the same way, a natural person, someone who's not born again, can't understand the things of the Spirit. Like it says in... John 3, 8. The wind blows where it wills. You hear the sound of it. You don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. But so is he, is everyone who's born of the Spirit. In other words, they're directed by the Holy Spirit. And the natural person, they look at you and think, you are weird. Because, man, you go to church what does it make sense? And the whole, you know, the whole lockdown thing, and, and you have noticed how they just don't understand. Why do you have to go to church? Why do you have to go? Can't you just do it on an internet? And you even have Facebook trying to get this metaverse thing going so you know you could have church through Facebook. Right. So you can make more money. It's impossible. They don't understand it when the scripture in Hebrews chapter 10 tells us not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the practice of some. But as long as it's today, they encourage one another and fellowship with one another. They don't see the necessity 
that we meet together and fellowship together and what takes place when we do that. They haven't a clue. They haven't a clue. The natural man does not get it. They don't understand when you talk to them, of course, about being born again. It takes a work of the Holy Spirit in a heart. You can't expect non-Christians to see the value of spiritual things because they're spiritually discerned, examined, or evaluated. That word for discern here means just that, is to be evaluated. How is something appraised? How is it valued? It's valued spiritually. And people who are looking for profit or looking for how they can control a situation, and they'll look at the church and it doesn't make sense to them because they can't get in there and make any sort of profit or have influence in it. Now, in verse 15, we see that the spiritual man, on the other hand, judges all things. He has the capacity. The spiritual man is the one who's been born again by the Spirit of God. He has the capacity to evaluate all things spiritually because he has the Spirit directing him if he's walking in the Spirit. What, and that's what's necessary for him to be walking in the Spirit. This doesn't mean that a Christian can't be criminally prosecuted, but that their judgment, but the judgment of the world is very limited in that scope. What I mean by this is that it's like uh, in California. The churches that I know, pastors I know kept the church open, they're being prosecuted. They're being sued by the state, things like that. Because you have spiritual wisdom doesn't mean there's not going to be consequences in the world for that wisdom. But ultimately, what is saying and what our Constitution structurally was framed around, well, you know, when you have, who was it who said, I think it was Washington, George Washington who said, that our constitution, or our constitution was written for a moral and religious people. It's totally unsuitable for anyone else. So all these people are trying to tell you what's going on. It's just, even our constitution's not suitable for them because it's spiritually discerned. Churches need to stay open in difficult situations for just this purpose, to know, for people to be able to know, to evaluate, to understand what's going on, make spiritual decisions. There's no one else who can do what the church does. And then finally we see in verse 16 that we because we have the mind of Christ. Isaiah 40, verses 13 and 14, we read there, who has directed the spirit of the Lord or who or as his counselor has taught him? With whom did he take counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? As we saw before, only God knows his mind and those to whom he reveals it by his spirit. 
be careful in receiving advice from soulish people. To have the mind of Christ is to look at life from Christ's point of view. And as a Christian, you should be looking at life like Jesus. As it says in 1 John 2, 6, he who says he abides in him, is abiding in Christ, ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Whoa. Okay, whoever here is doing that perfectly, would you raise your hand? I thought so. Notice I didn't raise my hand either. But see, this is the part of the, this is the sanctification process that's taking place. As we walk, as you know, we read in the New Testament as well, right now we're seeing as in a mirror darkly. Then we'll see face to face. You know, we'll know him as we've been known. But right now, it's uh, we're in the word, seeking to listen to the Holy Spirit, seeking to walk accordingly, imperfectly, because we're still here in our flesh, but growing, as it says in Romans 8, 28 and 29, for, you know, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. That's what we're doing here. We're being conformed into the image of Jesus. We're being made more like Jesus. That should be our heart. That should be our life goal. Yes, we have different ways that's applied with us individually, with one person being a teacher, another person, you know, being a contractor or whatever. But whatever God, whatever situation God has put you in, the ultimate goal is for you to be conformed into the image of Christ. And he knows what's so cool, what's so amazing to me as I walk is just to see how he knows every finite detail of my heart and my life. He knows what circumstance to allow to come around in my life so that it addresses an area of my life that he wants to address, that he wants me to surrender to him. That's how the spiritual man is supposed to live. Natural man doesn't have a clue. It doesn't have a clue. Next week, we're going to look at the carnal man. And we'll see more about him then. Not going to give me any clues. I'm always, you know, I get to this point and I'm tempted to preach the message before I write it. But I won't do that. So, we have seen that there's a great need for spiritual wisdom. Just to get along in life, to get along in this world. You know, even before all this pandemic confusion and all of that, we couldn't do it in ourselves, let alone the times we're living in now. But we can receive wisdom, the wisdom of God from the Spirit of God as we dig into his word, we allow him to work in our hearts the only condition is that you know him through faith in Jesus Christ and be walking in the Spirit. Be walking in the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Lord, your word to us. And knowing that in the times we're living in, and really any time, Lord, We have the ability to deal. We have the un ability to understand what is going on from your perspective by the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our life. So, Lord, we pray for wisdom. We all need it. And we know that that wisdom comes by your Spirit. Fill us afresh. Work in our hearts, Lord, to your glory. In Jesus' name. Let's stand as